I'm Vanessa Levin, and you're listening to Elevating Early Childhood. And if you've ever struggled with circle time or morning meeting in your classroom, then listen up, because I'm going to break it all down for you in this episode. I get asked questions daily from teachers around the world who struggle with getting their kids to listen or pay attention during circle time. And I get it. I've been there and done that. I've had kids in my classroom who prefer to play with their shoes, touch their neighbors, or roll around on the floor rather than participate in circle time. So here's the thing. If you want to have a successful and effective circle time, you have to start working smarter, not harder. For example, let's say you made a blueberry pie and it was a complete flop. It wasn't sweet enough and the crust tasted like cardboard. I might add a few things to the recipe to make the pie taste better. I might add some sugar to make it sweeter and some butter to make the crust taste better, right? This is the perfect example of working smarter, not harder, when it comes to achieving desired results. Now, what if instead I had tried to make the blueberry pie using the exact same ingredients and the exact same recipe as before? Would my pie taste any better? Probably not and I still wouldn't have achieved my desired results of a tasty blueberry pie. Now, the very same thing is true for circle time. If our desired results are to have a successful and effective circle time, then we must work smarter. And that means we need to know not just what ingredients to add, but how much of each one and when. Are you with me so far? So here's my secret recipe for circle time success. Are you ready? Ingredient number one is understanding young children's attention spans and how they develop. So on average, a neurotypical child can attend to something for two minutes per every year of their age. So let's take a four-year-old child. That's two, four, six, eight. So eight minutes. Wow. How long is your circle time right now? That's food for thought, right? Research tells us that the neurotypical human brain can only focus on a task for a limited amount of time before it begins to lose focus. And the younger the brain, the shorter the amount of time is, right? And then we also have to take into consideration that our children's attention spans will change over time. So what our circle time looks like in the very beginning of the year is going to be very different from what it looks like at the end of the year because young children are growing and learning every day. So if all of the children in your classroom were four years old on or before the first day of school, by the end of the year, they're closer to the age of five than they are four. So it makes sense that your circle time is going to be a little longer. Ingredient number two is balancing active and passive during circle time. When your children are just sitting and listening to you speak, that's considered passive. We often think of story time as a passive activity because the kids are just sitting and listening, which is why we strive to choose books that we read aloud during circle time that have a high engagement rate. Books like Pete the Cat, books like Tap the Magic Tree, These types of books invite the students to participate as they listen to the story being read aloud. Pointing to a letter, number, shape, or color and telling the children the name of that item is also considered passive because telling is not teaching. Young children don't learn by having adults tell them to do things. If that were true, they'd all pick up their toys whenever we ask them, right? When young children are required to wait for extended periods of time, this is considered passive. So for example, waiting for all the children in your classroom to use the restroom or waiting for a turn during show and tell. Don't even get me started on that one. Anytime you have an extended wait time for young children, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. Now, on the flip side, active times are when your students are participating along with you during circle time. For example, let's say you're singing 
the song Bingo with your kids. And you've pre-selected a bunch of letters, magnetic letters. Um, and of course, you've chosen secretly several B, I, N, G, and O letters, right? And you've passed one out to each student in your class. And then as you sing the song, you invite them to hold their letters up or even stand up and hold their letter as they hear it in the song. That's considered something active. And your kids would be having fun, but also learning at the same time. Active can mean songs and finger plays, really anything that you can do to invite your students to participate and move their bodies. Ingredient number three, have all your materials prepped and ready to go for circle time in advance. Trust me, this one sounds like a no-brainer, but it trips up so many teachers. Anytime we have all of our students gathered together in one place, the clock is ticking on their attention spans, right? We can't lose one precious minute at a time when we know that they have a very limited short attention span. If you don't have absolutely everything you need when you gather your students together for circle time, their little internal attention span clocks don't reset while they're waiting for you, right? You'll have to recalibrate your lesson on the fly, which is much easier said than done. So to recap, my secret recipe for a successful and effective circle time is number one, keep their attention spans in mind. Number two, is to balance your active and passive times. And ingredient number three is to have everything prepped and ready to go at your fingertips the moment you gather your students together. All three of those things together are going to create that successful and effective circle time. So now I'm gonna address those questions I get most often using those three ingredients as a guide. So question number one is, help. My kids don't listen during circle time. They roll around on the floor, play with their shoes and touch their friends. I hear you, been there and done that. So the first thing that I would do would be to ask myself, how long is my circle time? Because usually when we see these types of behaviors crop up, it means we're taking too long. There might even be too much wait time in there. And sometimes we're not making them wait for a specific reason. It's because we're working on getting the other children to pay attention and then we start to lose the kids who were, right? So I would look at that first. How long is your circle time? And what is it that you're doing when these behaviors are occurring so we can pinpoint where the problem is? The next thing I might think about is, are your active and passive times during circle time balanced? So do you have something active followed by something passive followed by something active? I would think about that as well. Those are the two things I would go back to. And then the third thing about having your materials ready, make sure that you have everything ready to go. Even turning your back on your students to play a particular song on your phone or reach for a pointer or any time when you take your eyes off of them, that can be wait time. And that's when we see problems cropping up, right? Question number two is, how do I fit it all in during circle time because their attention spans are short? So this person already knows the attention spans of the children are short, but they feel obligated to fit it all in. So first things first, I wanna remind you that there is no rule that says you must teach all the things during circle time. Circle time is not the only time that we teach during the day in preschool and pre-K. We teach during centers. We teach all throughout the day, we're teaching things. And there are things that can be taught outside of circle time. So the first thing I want you to do is to remember that you are not obligated to teach all the things during circle time. Learning occurs throughout the day. The second thing I want you to remember is that children don't learn by us telling them things, right? They don't set and get while we pour the information into their brains. We don't teach at them. 
right? We teach with them. So we can't sit there and tell them the color of the day, the number of the day, the shape of the day, the letter of the day or week and point these out and have them repeat, even looking for them with funny glasses around the room. That's not teaching, right? That's telling and also entertaining, but it's not teaching. So remove yourself from the obligation to do these outdated practices that aren't research-based, that aren't going to get your kids to learn things. Because if they're learning a color, let's say the color yellow, because they're at centers and they're in the dramatic play center and the baby that they're playing with has a yellow blanket or a yellow dress. And you walk by and say, oh my goodness, I love your baby's dress. What color is that? They're more motivated to either A, learn the color yellow if they haven't already, but I'm willing to bet that most of your kids already know their colors, right? So we don't want to be teaching something to the whole group when most of the kids already know it or some of the kids already know it. It's a waste of some kids' time. What are the kids doing when you're teaching about the color of the day that's yellow if 50% of them or more already know it? right? We're wasting some children's time and we know their time and attention is super precious. And take some other things into consideration like weather. I don't know where in the golden book that it's written that we must do the weather during circle time, right? There is no requirement that weather has to be done during circle time. And I also challenge you to think about um, what is your purpose, for looking at the weather each day. What do you do with the information or the data that's been collected, right? Unless you're actually doing something with that information, such as um, creating a graph or a chart, and you're interpreting the data that you've collected and counting and comparing, unless you're doing all that, there is no purpose for looking at the weather each day. So remove yourself from that obligation too. And if you do feel the need to do weather every day, Think about it. Where does it fall in the standards that you're teaching? It's probably more of a math and science thing, right? Although it does have oral language components in it, you can move it to those times of the day. You can even move it to center time and make weather check-in a center time activity. There is no need to keep doing things the way we've always done them because it's what we've always done. So if you're seeing problems with circle time, think outside the box and use those three key ingredients to let you shape how you go forward with circle time. And remember, if you're trying to fit it all into circle time and your circle time goes on and on past their attention spans, what are you doing? That's right, you're rolling a boulder uphill, right? And that's no fun for anyone. Okay, question number three is, what if my kids don't sing along or participate? My answer to that is, so what? If your kids don't sing along or participate, it is not a reflection on you as a teacher, right? It tells us how comfortable that student or students feel with participating. Every single child is different. Not every child is gonna be thrilled when you sing bingo with the class because some children learn things quickly and they take to things like fish to water, other children need to warm up to things. So just because they don't sing bingo with you the first one or two times you do it doesn't mean they won't on the third, fourth, or the fifth time. That's why doing a lot of things repetitively in your classroom, such as the, the uh, morning greeting that's always the same, such as some of the songs that you use for cleanup, for example, are always the same because not all children are going to either get it, absorb it, or be comfortable with participating with it at first, right? So if you've ever had a parent say to you, like at parent-teacher conferences, maybe you say to the parent, I'm really concerned because so-and-so doesn't participate when we sing, and the parent says, what? All he does at home is sing the songs from school. I know this one, R-E-D, red, R-E-D, red, you know, that tells you all that you need to know. That child doesn't participate in class because they're just not there yet. But boy, do they do it at home. So that's a comfort issue, right? That student doesn't feel comfortable doing at school it at school yet. And that's okay because they will eventually become comfortable. And for some children, especially your second language learners, it could take all year 
I have had students who've been in my classroom who refused to speak at school because they were learning a second language and they didn't feel confident yet. And then go on to the next grade level and talk up a storm. It didn't say that I was a bad teacher. It's just that they needed more time to feel comfortable. So don't see it as a reflection on your teaching. Most important thing, if you have children who aren't participating, who aren't engaging, is not to force them because our job is not to force, right? Our job is to facilitate and lead and have the children follow. It is not to force them to do anything because when you force a child to do something, what you do is you break trust with them, right? So for example, I was a very quiet and shy student. I would be one of those kids who would not participate in bingo until I knew every single word by heart and I felt confident. And then I would have to work up the courage to do it in front of my friends. So it might take me to uh, feel comfortable doing bingo with my class. If my teacher had forced me to do it, it would have gone very poorly. I would not have ever participated again. Every child is different. And not every child is going to be engaged and on task. And it is not your fault. So don't take it personally. Okay, so, so far we've talked about those three key ingredients for having a successful and effective circle time. And I've addressed the three most common questions I get about circle time. Now let's break it down to the actual ingredients or components of a successful circle time. So component number one is your picture schedule. This is a must have for a successful and effective circle time. And your picture schedule will show a picture of circle time or morning meeting, whatever you call it. And so when you start this time of day with your kids, you're going to sing your morning greeting song, whatever that greeting song is that you've determined. We have a whole blog post about good morning songs or greeting songs, and we'll link that in the show notes for you. But you sing that song and you point to the picture of your morning meeting or circle time on your picture schedule to let the children know that the day is beginning. Okay, so after you've pointed to your schedule and you've sung your morning greeting song, now it's time for what I call taking attendance. Now, this is not old school. Raise your hand if you're here. This is something that your kids did prior to starting circle time. So when they entered your classroom, they checked in in some way, whether that is using a sign-in sheet if you're in Head Start, whether that's putting their name card in a pocket, whether that's doing a feelings check-in. I have used all three of those ways in my classroom before, but it's some way of letting teachers and other students know that you're there. It's just an official start to the day. But then we review that information during circle time. So one way I like to do that is by using a T-chart. And that T-chart, I'll put a picture of it here on the screen for you. It has at home and at school, and the children can move their name card or whatever it is you've decided to use to the appropriate side. I have one child designated as my absence or attendance helper, and that person puts the pictures or the cards of the children who are absent on that side that says home. Now that we've collected that data, right? Now we need to analyze that data. That means we need to count who's here, how many, count who are absent, how many, that type of thing. So when they come into the classroom and they check in quite often, my attendance board is one of those things they do to check in. Then we look at that data during circle time. This just gives us all a common ground, right? It allows me to greet the children that are there, right? So we've started with our picture schedule and our morning greeting song, and we've said good morning to the people that are there. We wished the children who are absent well. That's from Dr. Becky Bailey's Conscious Discipline. After we do that, we are going to read our story for the day. And that story might have a little opener, right? It might be, I have a tray of items in front of me, just a few things I've pulled from centers or other places in my room, like on a tray or in a basket. And maybe I'll present it to the students. 
let's say we're learning about the farm, right? Maybe the, today is the first day we're learning about the farm. So I might have this tray of items in front of me that I've taken from centers. There's like a pig and a cow and maybe a sheep that I took from the block center, a tractor. And I've put them on this tray or in a basket and I show it to them and I say, oh my, look at what I have here. I wonder what these are. I might pass a few of those things around to let them touch and feel. What do you know about these things? What does this remind you of? You know, and just start a conversation about it. You're going to help guide that conversation to the word farm. And you're going to say, oh, I wonder if we're going to be learning about the farm today. That reminds me, I have this great book about a farm I'd like to read to you. Would you like to read it? And then we're going to read the story. And of course, that's going to be an interactive one. Hopefully, if it's not, I can make it interactive by having them point to things and come up and touch things. And then once we're done with that read aloud, right, then we're going to have some kind of participatory song, right? So whether that's a finger play or an actual song, it's got some kind of movement to it. So we get their bodies moving. And then after that song, I'm going to review the schedule of what comes next. So we looked at it when we got together, right? And I pointed to the first picture, which was our morning meeting or a circle time picture in the schedule. And now I'm going to point out what comes next. And I can also go over the rest of the day if I want to. And you do this every single day, all year long. It lets your children know exactly what comes next. It helps them feel confident and comfortable and safe right? In their school environment. And you're going to say, and now comes whatever comes next. Could be, let's say it's center time. And now comes center time. And remember at center time, how do we, you might want to review something if it's beginning of the year or remember at center time, don't forget, Miss Wanda has pumpkins over in the science center for you. If you want to go observe with her, she'll be scooping out the inside of the pumpkin, the pulp and the seeds, you know, Sometimes I do like a promo for some of the centers that are going on or some of the centers I want to highlight, but something very short. And that way you got everything in, in your eight minutes or 10 minutes or whatever time of the year it is with whatever age group you teach and off they go to the next thing, right? That's the perfect circle time recipe. Now, it's going to look different in everyone's classroom because we all have different songs. We have different books. We have different um, ways that we take attendance or ways that we do things. But that's the general gist of it. That is what a successful circle time looks like. And if you want more information about circle time, how it works, what to look for, what to do, um, songs to sing, anything like that, we're going to have some blog posts for you in the show notes. Um, if you're watching along on YouTube, just click below this video. There should be a little arrow and you will find the show notes there. If you're listening, then you're going to go to prekpages.com and type in circle time and you'll be able to find those blog posts and resources there as well. So until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, onward and upward. Bye.